please join me in welcoming our next, our first speaker, Coach Kerry. Oh man, I'm excited to be here. It's a good looking group. I'm excited. It's Saturday morning, so I really appreciate you all being here because waking up early on a Saturday can be tough. I totally understand. I'm with you on that. Just want to make sure, oh, slides are up and running. All right, let's rock and roll. So thank you, Lewis, for that gracious intro. I love it. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more. Bless you. I got your back. <laughs> so like you said, um, I've been through a lot of ups and downs in my life. And I just want to make sure I don't do that to you guys again. And I want to share a little bit about that with you because truly I believe that confidence is the backbone of everything we do. And the reason I think that is because when I was younger, I was bullied a lot. I cried every day, I hated school, I never wanted to be there. And so when I changed schools in grade three, I kind of had the mentality of let me hurt them before they hurt me. Right, it's kind of a natural mindset when you've been bullied the whole time before. But how many friends do you think I made? None. Nobody wanted to be my friend because I was the bully. And I'm all about positive vibes, being a good friend, and being there for people. So that actually really hurt me. So when I changed schools in grade four, I thought, OK, I got to do something different. I've been the bully. I've been bullied. What can I do differently? And I really wasn't sure. So I walk into the classroom in grade four, and I'm the only new kid. I'm the only fat kid. I'm the only black kid. Easy target, so everyone's making fun of me, snickering, laughing about me, pointing at me. I barely make it through attendance, and I just bawl my eyes out. I'm talking like sobbing. You know the ugly cry, you're like wiping your nose and it's a mess? That kind of cry. And I remember thinking, you know, I can't call mom and dad because I left for work already. Something deep down told me that I was gonna have to do this on my own. And I distinctively remember looking at myself in the mirror and saying, you've done this before, You'll do this again. You have friends. So I wipe my tears away. I look at myself in the mirror. I'm like, all right, you got this. Let's go. So somehow, some way, from my walk to the washroom, back to the classroom, I came up with an idea. And I truly believe that this changed the trajectory of my entire life. So I went back to the classroom, and I went around the room, and I introduced myself to every single kid and learned their name and something about them. And only, I was only grade four, so obviously I didn't realize it at the time, but I knew I was onto something. And I disarmed them. I took away their preconceived notions. I took away their reason for wanting to be mean to me without even knowing me. It is much harder to bully someone or be mean to someone when you understand their story and you understand where they're coming from. I went on to switch schools about, let's say, four more times. So I guess you could say I was getting pretty good at making new friends, right? And switching schools is hard in general. Show hands if anyone's ever switched schools and been the new kid. So you know what that feels like, right? You're not sure who to have lunch with, you're not sure to talk to. It can be awkward. So in grade 10, when I switched schools again, at this time, I was also over 600 pounds. 600 pounds. I was morbidly obese. And so switching schools in the middle of high school is hard in general. But switching schools when you're morbidly obese, perhaps a little bit harder. And so everyone was kind of worried that I was going to be bullied again. My parents, my friends. And to be completely honest, so was I. But first day of grade 10, what do you think I did? I had my tool. So I walked to the classroom and introduced myself to every single kid, learned their name, something about them. And we all became friends. I disarmed them. I went on to become prom queen and most popular kid in school. And everybody asked me, how were you able to do that? How did you have the confidence to do that? How did you have that kind of self-love? Even kids that I see now from my high school, that are like, hey, back in the day when we were in high school together, I mean, I'm not that old, but. <laughs> <laughs> back in the day when we were in high school together, I looked up to you. You were so confident. How did you do that? And for a while, I really had to think to myself, you know, what was it? What made me any different from anybody else? And what I realized was that it was all about the tools that I created for myself which is consisted of some things like self-love, compassion, kindness, respect. And I was able to do that everywhere I went. And it wasn't just a matter of talking about it, but it was a matter of actually putting it into action. So if I saw you know, a grade nine sitting by themselves at lunch, I'd be the first person to go sit with them. If I saw a grade 12 being mean to a grade 10, I'd intercept. You really, I really wanted to embody it and walk the talk. 
I really didn't think it was possible to just talk about it. And that was something that I was really passionate about, was just being an ally, being there for others. And so from, after grade 10, I went on to university and I did events for 10 years, which was amazing. And I started to feel very unfulfilled. And I realized that unfulfillment comes from a lack of purpose, uncertainty, and a lack of self-love. Even though I had built so much self-love for myself when I was younger, when you're figuring out what to do, university, bills, society, a lot of things happen at once. And so when I started to feel very unfulfilled, I thought, okay, it's time for me to get back to the drawing board. What makes me happy? How can I continue to do the things that I love but make a career out of it? And now I've been able to do so. And so when I think about doing the things that I love and how I was able to do that, at 27, I heard about coaching. And for me, it felt like I would really just found my life purpose. It felt like it had connected all the dots that were happening throughout my entire life. And what I realized is that fulfillment only comes from true inner happiness. And obviously what works for me may not work for you and what works for them may not work for you, but the idea is, is that you figure out what works best for you and then add that to your toolbox. I talk a lot about a toolbox, and we're gonna, we're gonna break it down for you in just a second, but really what I mean by a toolbox is the things that you do to make you feel at your best. Everyone sort of has their tools, the things that they do when they're having a bad day or a sad day, but we don't recognize them as a tool. And so my goal is that people will pick them up off the floor in their bedroom or hiding under their desk and actually put it in the toolbox so that it comes with them everywhere they go. And then it's readily accessible. So the next time you're having a bad day, a sad day, you're in a funk, rather than maybe going to your default or your vices or things that actually don't serve you and are perhaps not positive, you'll go to the things that are in your toolbox to bounce back quicker. So I've created sort of five ways that you can do that for yourself to achieve and maintain your own inner confidence, your own fulfillment. And these are things that I've created through countless hours of research, working with over a thousand clients for coaching. And if these don't work for you, that's okay. But the idea is that they will be thought provoking enough that you will go home and create your own. So the first one is self-love and self-care. This is probably something you've heard of, but how often do you actually take the time to implement it into your life? Self-love is about doing the things that work best for you that make you feel good. And that could be anything because we're all different. So I have some examples up here, meditation, exercise, grooming, but the idea is that they serve you in a positive way. So when I think of grooming, let's give an example of, let's say, a manicure. And let's say someone goes for a mani-pedi every week. But if it's outside of your budget, it's now hindering you. Or you could plan to go get a manicure once a month when it fits within your budget, and then it's self-love and it's empowering you. Slight difference, but it can have a world of a difference and impact in your life. Now, the next one that I have up there that's really important that I want to break down is conscious quality of time with oneself. I get asked this about this all the time. And so, conscious quality of time with yourself is truly taking the time to actually the intention to be alone. So, Netflix and chill is not solo time. I see a couple people laughing, right? We think it is, because you're alone, and you're watching something that you may like. And I don't think that Netflix is bad. I love Netflix. But if I had a bad day and I'm angry and I'm frustrated and I have tons of work to do the next day and I sit and watch Netflix for hours, how is that serving me? It then becomes a negative and then I'm annoyed and then I'm upset with myself. So now I use Netflix as a reward. Watch all my favorite shows once I've gotten all my work done. But I also take the time to be conscious about my alone time. And that's something that's new for you and you've never really done before. Then I have four questions for you to start with. And I would say maybe do that for two weeks, a couple of nights a week, as much as you can, and just start here. Because from there, so much more will come out of it, and it's a good place to start if you're not sure how to start writing or unpacking yourself, as I like to call it. So question number one is gonna be, what worked well for me today? Question number two is, what didn't work well for me today? Question number three is, what fueled me? And question number four is, what drained me? Then from there, you'll be able to see what works well for you and what doesn't. So if you see that every time you hang out with this person, you feel drained, perhaps the next week you won't hang out with that person. Or every time you do one of your favorite things, you feel refueled, 
Then maybe the next week you'll add more of that into your week. Next one, doing the things that bring you joy. I've found that a lot of people seem to confuse joy and happiness. So joy is really something you can only give to yourself, whereas happiness you can find in almost anything. And so the easiest example I can give you of how to create joy in your life is hobbies. You know, when we're young, we have a million hobbies, hockey, soccer, basketball, acting, singing, dancing, whatever it is. But then university, decision, society, bills, etc., show up. And those things sort of start to fall on the back burner. And so if there's something that you already love to do, now put that in your toolbox. So if you, let's say someone loves to draw, if they're my client, I said, okay, you love to draw, when was the last time you drew? And they said years ago. I'd be like, okay, draw anytime you're having a bad day, sad day, or not feeling off. So whatever it is that you have that you do for you, that you enjoy, that you do for no other reason than because it makes you feel good, you don't care of the outcome or winning or anything like that, add that back into your life more often and it's going to help refuel your energy. Sometimes the slides work, sometimes they don't. <laughs> there we go. The next one, goals and momentum. So in school and work, we often have goals and they keep us accountable. They let us project and see where we're going and they keep us on track. But all too often, we forget about our own personal goals. So if, that, if we know that it works well in school and business, why not do that for ourselves? And the problem is sometimes people create these really big goals that are kind of not attainable. For example, let's say someone says, I want to be a millionaire by tomorrow. Okay, perhaps not that realistic. <coughs> but why don't we break that down? So that goal could then become, you know what, I want to save 50 bucks a month. Okay, so do that for three months. And then after three months, you're like, you know what? I'm gonna save 75 bucks a month now. And then you do that for three months. And then you're like, you know what? I'm feeling good. Let's save 100 bucks a month. And now I know how to save. And then you're in momentum. So either way, you're still getting to the goal, but we've broken it down to a smaller goal to help keep you motivated and help keep you on track. So creating those goals for yourself to challenge yourself, to make you want to rise, to make you want to be better, better version of yourself, whatever that may be, because we're all different, right? My goal for my weight loss was to lose weight. If I had said to myself every single day, you gotta lose 300 pounds, how motivated do you think I'd be? Probably not a lot. That is such a big and daunting number. So instead I said, I gotta lose five pounds. I gotta lose five pounds the next month. Maybe three pounds the month after that. And breaking it down into smaller increments actually made it easier, easier for me to actually think about it and not get stressed or overwhelmed. So whatever that is that's happening in your life, there's a way for you to break it down and look at it in smaller bite-sized pieces. Stopping the negative self-talk. So every single person in this room, because you're a human, have a self-talk. The talk that says you can do this, the talk that says you can't do this, we all have it. And that's great, but how much is it serving you? I don't think there's anything wrong with constructive criticism and being hard on ourselves at times to keep us motivated. But when it becomes a negative cycle, it actually is demotivating. It'll hinder your confidence and potentially hold you back. So when I say negative self-talk, what I mean is, for example, let's say you're the person who forgets your homework at home. And so when you show up to school, you go, oh, I'm such an idiot, I'm so stupid, I forgot it. That's negative self-talk. Or you could say to yourself, you know what, I forgot my homework today but now I'm gonna set a reminder in my phone to help me so that I don't do that again. One is empowering and positive, and one is negative and hindering. So the way you talk to yourself, I'm really big on language, saying to yourself, I need to do this, I have to do this, still negative. So I encourage all of you to consider how you actually talk to yourself consistently, because sometimes we don't even notice it. I don't even have to-do lists anymore, I just have choose lists because I always have a choice. We're so fortunate enough to live in Canada that we always have the opportunity to learn, grow, evolve. We have access to Google, we have access to books, we have access to the library. There's always something we can do different to be the better version of ourselves that we want to be. Boundaries. 
This one is really important, and that's why I leave it for last, because I feel like boundaries are tricky. Boundaries are really important because they help us respect ourselves and teach others how to respect us as well. And so the problem is, is that sometimes when we try to implement new boundaries, the people who are impacted by them respond negatively. And when they respond negatively, it makes it that much harder for us to actually want to continue to do it because it's actually so hard. No one wants to be met with negativity, but the trick is if you're met with negativity by doing something new to honor and respect yourself and that person gets mad at you or responds negatively, then chances are a boundary needs to go up between you and that person. Now just because you're putting up a boundary between you and somebody doesn't mean you have to hate them or treat them poorly or cut them out of your life forever just might mean there needs to be a boundary. For example, let's say there's one friend that loves to go out and party. You go, you know what, I'm gonna focus on my grades this month, I'm gonna focus on homework or work or school, you don't wanna go out. And so when you say it to that person, you go, you know what, I'm not gonna go out for a month, I'm gonna focus on school and work. And they go, what? Oh, how dare you, you're my partying partner, how would you do this to me? So they made it about themselves and made it negative and now trying to guilt trip you. And so you don't have to hate that person, just mean, oh, a boundary. So now you know that when you do feel like partying, you call that friend. But you don't call that friend when you're having a bad day, you need to vent, or you're crying. So you're just gonna show, you get to choose how people show up in your life and put yourself back in control. The key about respecting ourselves, is that changes how we trust ourselves, that changes our confidence, and that changes our fulfillment. And so I learned a lot about building my fulfillment and that's helped me be successful in who I am and how I am today. And I wanna leave you with three things, four things. Number one, something my dad would always say to me is come to me with solutions, not problems. And as a kid, that was very frustrating. It's like, there's a problem, we gotta deal with it. But now as an adult, it's one of my mantras. I don't dwell on the problems. I recognize them, I reflect but then I focus on solutions to keep me forward, to keep me positive, to keep me moving in the way that I want to go. Has changed everything. Number two, is these are some of the things that I've learned when I was in school and I was trying to be a leader, trying to build my fulfillment and my confidence. Is that you may not, have to, you may not like everybody in your class or in your school, and, but that does not mean you get to treat them poorly. Number three, is that never forget how powerful words can be. And the last one is you never know what someone may be going through. And so I encourage us all to lead with kindness and work on building our own inner fulfillment because I truly believe that's what can help change the world and make sure that we live the best life that we want for ourselves. Thank you all so much. Woo!